Uh, good morning, thank you. So I'd like to tell you about uh, WASM and how we use it in Sony Atrios. Atrios is, uh, here's an outline because I have so many slides, you know, we actually need an outline. Um, Atrios is a, basically a product suite that envisions bringing to market intelligent and programmable vision sensors. So it's a platform that can be used for various verticals to create applications, uh, such as the ones I will, I will show a little bit later. And because we wanted to make this an easy to program environment, um, eventually, you know, WASM became a, a big help in this area. Okay. So I think we talked about this before, and uh, everybody here perfectly understands these problems. So the reason we started with this in the first place is for safety, you know, on microcontrollers without memory protection, without hardware memory protection. That was our initial motivation for using uh, WebAssembly. So we needed to do over-the-air updates, dynamically linking components into uh, this real-time OS, and we really couldn't do that in any reasonable way, so we decided to sandbox the, uh, the OTA updatable components with, with WASM. And then we got more ambitious and said, well, this, is a, this platform is pretty cool because we can also target various source languages to it. Maybe we can actually make the development easier than just what we have currently, which is a, a straight C uh, environment. And eventually, you know, we were also thinking that if we have such you know, loadable components with standardized interfaces, we could develop a marketplace of uh, applications that uh, third parties could put in there and therefore, again, it becomes more like Android, quote unquote. So what are some of the difficulties with the traditional embedded development? Uh, it's hard because it's C. I'm, not a lot of people know C anymore, unfortunately. And uh, also, it is a very constrained environment with particular you know, limitations versus running on Linux in the cloud, let's say. right? Maintenance is difficult because after the, uh, the product ships, typically uh, it's hard to update the firmware. And firmware release cycles are actually really, really long uh, in general. So if we wanted to make any kind of functional change and wait for a uh, actual QA cycle, that would be very not agile, let's say. And finally, security, uh, there are always bugs. Bugs always happen and we need to patch them as soon as possible at least by isolating some of the uh, functionality into the sandbox, it makes that less likely to cause a, a critical system you know, vulnerability, and if there is one, we can, we can patch it easily with an OTA update. So, and I, I found this quote somewhere, but you know, they said that the number one source of security vulnerabilities is memory bugs. It sounds believable, and that's certainly one thing that uh, WASM helps us with. Then we get into this you know, polyglot development thing. So as I mentioned, typically all the development is in C in these environments, but we would like to enable uh, other languages. And, and there's actually a motivation for this. You know? So the most popular programming languages in general are, are not you know, C, C++, and Rust. Rust is very beautiful, but it's not that popular, relatively speaking. Uh, at the top, we have like, things like JavaScript, Python. Uh, so you know, that's important for us. And we do computer vision, AI, and Python is the language that everybody uses in that area on the, on the server side for training. And so we wanted to see if we can enable some of the same functionality on the inference side on device with, with Python. Um, so, right, we know WASM is good for this because we can decouple the source language, the target architecture, and the OS uh, by targeting this common uh, interface. Uh, this, this common runtime, and then the interfaces you know, that go along with that. So we've invested some into uh, WASI extensions. Uh, sometimes you know, we don't care if they're proprietary, but uh, so we're trying to push some things up. Okay, so I'll tell you briefly about this Atrios uh, Edge app development tools that, that we've developed. Um, so you know, what, what do we want to show here? Uh, it's basically what's at our, our booth you know, at the demo. So we have the developer, and he wants to sit down at his computer and create a project, build it, and deploy it to the device in a relatively easy way, right? And, and that's, the, uh, that's the device that we have at the booth. It's actually uh, embedding one of these intelligent vision sensors and a microcontroller. It's actually an ESP32. It doesn't have a lot of memory, and it's running a real-time OS. Uh, not X, doesn't matter. So 
you know, what, what does the, uh, the programmer want to do? So we created this, uh, this local tool, which essentially is a CLI and a GUI. And we also have this uh, backend, which we call EVP. It's Edge Virtualization Platform that communicates with the device over MQTT and HTTP for different, you know, MQTT for the control plane and the telemetry data, HTTP for like the, you know, blob type artifacts, including the, uh, the deployable modules. And so what it does is it does kind of on the fly specialization for whatever the device type happens to be. So the, the programmer will use the CLI to generate some skeleton code I guess I'll, I'll show some code a little bit later. And uh, then build it, build the WASM, and then say load it, you know, load it into the, into the back end using the uh, a REST API, just locally. And then say deploy it. And when you do deploy it, then we are starting this lifecycle management of the application, which may kick off a uh, AOT compilation job for the target. Maybe it'll do some testing, you know, like checking out at least the filtering imports and exports just to see that you're not doing something weird, right? Because we don't trust the developer, obviously. And, uh, and then creating the, the AOT compiled artifact, then sending the instructions to the edge device. Here's what you should do, you know, or rather this is what your, the state you should have, and then the agent on the device will reify the deployment, grab the, the blob using HTTP, right? This is basically how the system works. Um, so what is the edge stack that we have on the device? It, essentially, it's something like this. You know? So at the bottom, we have hardware. Uh, the ESP32 is using this Extensa instruction set. We also can support, of course, ARM, uh, AMD64, I mean, x86, and uh, RISC-V. So RISC-V is something that we're playing around with just because there are a lot of microcontrollers that have moved to RISC-V architecture. The OS, uh, of course, we run on Linux. You know, at our booth, we also have uh, the Raspberry Pi uh, in addition to the, uh, to the ESP32-based device. Um, and NUTX, we, we, we're running because that's, that's what we were using for a while, and, and that's the, the OS we're, we're going with. But we're planning to add support for other stuff, like running on, on Zephyr, perhaps, because that has a very broad support for a lot of uh, microcontrollers and boards. Then after that, we have native libraries. Native libraries uh, are interesting. It, it's really a mishmash of stuff that, that we're interested in. So for example, we have like uh, TensorFlow Lite you know, for the, the inferencing in, in certain contexts. We have OpenCV for doing like image manipulation. And you know, we have device drivers like to interact with the sensor. So the sensors you know, have, um, Sony has this, uh, this SDK for sensors called SenseCord. And it abstracts like a bunch of different you know, sensors in the portfolio, but that's all in the native stuff. And then we expose that into the, you know, uh, the application layer using either you know, WASI standard stuff or you know, these edge services APIs that I'll mention that are just basically the things that we, we, we want to provide to the application layer. Okay? And then on top of that, we have the modules that are, that are running uh, you know, the actual user code. Okay? So, so what is the EVP agent? Well, it's like a kubelet, you know, essentially, but for tiny devices. Uh, it's certainly not as nearly as sophisticated, but it does enough for, for what we need. And we're using Whammer, and it communicates with the backend via MQTT. Right? So the edge services APIs that, that we expose essentially fall into these four buckets at the moment. You know, we have the interactions with the sensor. So like you can read an image, you can configure the frame rate, you can configure lots of things, you know, but essentially there are things to interact with the sensor. We have communication, like sending telemetry data to the EVP backend over MQTT, or from one you know, the type of sensor to another sensor directly, uh, currently via sockets. That is, uh, we don't expose sockets directly to the application. We don't allow you to like create a socket but we can set up a channel during the deployment and that, you can, that the application then can use, okay? And WESINN, so the, the neural network inferencing, you can load a model, you can run the inference. That's, for example, where we would use TF Lite, you know, in the native side. If there's another type of uh, accelerator, like we, we do use like the Google Edge TPU, Coral, you know, we, we embed that, that native part as well 
the application sort of can't, can't tell what it's using, right? And then data storage, so we have like, you know, local embedded database or the blob storage where you can access the, uh, you know, artifacts, like I said, using put, get, you know, post, et cetera, from, uh, from the back end. Okay, so uh, this is the <laughs> GUI version of the tool that we've developed. Uh, we can go and play around with it later if you want. Basically, it's a developer-focused tool where you can easily, you got your, your sensor device, you can onboard it, you know, you scan this QR code, essentially, and then it knows where to connect. And then you can, you know, configure its, its settings, uh, you can uh, start streaming, doing inference, and deploying uh, an application, an AI model, onto, onto the sensing device. So we have both the GUI and the, and the CLI, right? The CLI is, has the same functionality, essentially, uh, but uh, it also has the functionality of, you know, generating the skeleton code and compiling it. Okay. So this is a bunch of C code, and uh, I didn't prepare this well. I apologize. But essentially, it's a, uh, an event-driven type of framework where you, you know, generate the code and you start filling out, you know, these, these handlers. So on create, essentially, like when the application gets uh, when the module gets instantiated, you have to do certain things there, like in this case, you're opening the uh, stream of the sensor so you can read it. And then on iterate is called basically as frequently as is configured, uh, and then you're, you're allowed to get the frame data you know, and start processing it. Now, we don't actually copy large data into the sandbox, into the WebAssembly sandbox. We keep handles to native memory because these things can be very large and there's really no good reason to copy it at the moment. We don't do the actual man image manipulation inside uh, the sandbox. We do the control, essentially. Okay? And then there's other you know, methods that we can emit uh, the uh, metadata over to the, the back end. So let me show you some you know, example applications. Besides the one at the booth with the, with the car, that one is relatively simple because all it does is just do the position detection and the visual, visualization is with Grafana. But this demo is actually really uh, interesting because it's much more realistic. So it's for license plate reading, which you could imagine using in, like, uh, in a logistics context, you know, like a truck is backing up to a loading dock and it needs to read the license plate or read something you know, from, the, from the back of the truck. So, uh, we have the, the sensor device, and it's using the, uh, the intelligent sensor that has a built-in DSP. And it, this one is actually based on Raspberry Pi, but that doesn't, that doesn't really matter. It would work the same on the, on the tiny uh, ESP32-based device. Okay. So essentially what happens is we run one neural network inference for detecting the license plate, detecting you know, its position in the frame. Then we crop the original image just to take the license plate out. We do another neural network uh, inference to detect the individual characters. And then we run it through an actual like, algorithm that will, based on the characters, the, the type of the characters and their relative positions, will generate a string, which is the actual, the only thing we want to send from the, uh, from the device. Okay, so it looks something like this, more or less, in terms of the data flow. The, Stuff that says IMAX 500 is all running inside the sensor and the DSP. It's, it's in one package. So the image comes from the image sensor to the ISP that just does the basic uh, image signal processing to get it into a usable RGB form. Then running the inference uh, to detect license plates on the DSP. And then two things are sent you know, from there to the, to the host CPU. The original raw image and the, this metadata of the, of the detection, the bounding box. And then we go into this, you know, sense cord, you know, SDK that will essentially, eventually use the OpenCV functionality that I mentioned is in the native to crop, then do the second inferencing. That one actually we would do using like TF Lite on the host CPU or using Coral, okay, which is a, another, uh, the edge TPU accelerator. And then finally, that information, those bounding boxes and their classes are sent to this LPR logic, license plate reading logic, which will actually generate the uh, string of the license plate, okay? So, and we, we, uh, so we hacked up Node-RED, you know, maybe, maybe somebody's familiar with Node-RED, it's kind of this flow-based programming, you know, paradigm, to create the nodes that we need, you know, to put this application together. 
because we, we want to, you know, our idea is to encourage reuse, right? So we compiled all the different logic functions into these uh, separate WebAssembly modules. They're represented as these nodes. And then the, the user can, you know, drag and drop and connect these things up. Uh, I just took a screenshot because the video takes too long to, to go through. But, uh, you know, I, could, I can show this to you later if you want. And essentially, you know, this is the data flow represented. Then you deploy this, and the system will actually create a deployment manifest that gets sent to the device. It also, of course, will do the uh, ahead of time compilation as necessary for the, uh, the modules, depending on where you're deploying to. Okay? And then the result is, is essentially this. So in this, in this demo, in fact, it, it does something that you wouldn't necessarily do in production. Uh, you, you can see on the top right, it says send image. Uh, it actually just does that only for the demo purposes only. Normally, you would only send the string. Okay? And the bottom you know, uh, flow actually sends this telemetry data. That's only the, the string information of the license plate. So this is what it looks like. You see there is the, the image with uh, the bounding box overlaid just to see that the detection happened. And then on the right side is the actual string of the, uh, uh, that, was, that was coming out of the uh, license plate reading logic. Okay? So it's an example of something that's you know, easy to, uh, to reuse. Okay, so this is my uh, call to action. I actually revised my talk you know, quite a bit you know, after seeing uh, yesterday's presentations and talking to people. Uh, you know, <laughs> my favorite graphic to put into, uh, to put into presentations. Uh, so I think, you know, we're all developers, and at least we cater to developers, you know, of our, using our platform. Uh, and I think we all need to do a, a better job of, you know, satisfying developers of all sorts, right? So what, what does WASM, WASM need to improve? Lots of things. Observability and debuggability. I think, uh, you know, maybe this is not a popular opinion, but the JVM and the, you know, Microsoft's .NET CLR really set the bar, and we are not there at all, right? Um, more, more on that. Host and guest bindings, you know, for C and C++. We use C++ extensively, uh, and the current uh, bind gen is, is really bad. I mean, it's like, it's good, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't support this well. And, I, and I've been hearing yesterday that this is in the works of, of improving right now. Uh, that's great. But uh, you know, the, a lot of demos we saw are in Rust, and Rust is very beautiful, but we don't have any Rust. Nobody writes Rust in our, in our organization. We have C++ and, uh, and lots of it. Um, Python, you know, so we've, I, I didn't get into the Python uh, details. Uh, we've, we've done limited and sort of narrow support for Python in several different ways. Uh, we tried transpiling it to C++. We tried Cython. Now we're trying MicroPython. None of them are, are ideal, in, uh, obviously. But uh, it, it'll work well enough for, for our narrow use case. But somehow, we, we need a much better way to do this, including the fact that there are all these existing libraries in, in Python that have native backends. We need to import those in without like just linking the native part into, into the uh, the. OS, you know, in our case, right? There, there, there must be a better way. Uh, and one thing that I'm personally interested in is like shared memory and multi-memory support in, in, again, in C and C++. Uh, I'll get into that in a, in a later slide. And then support for embedded systems. So thank God that Whammer exists because somebody was interested in this for a very particular use case at Intel, but it's the only runtime that we can use. I know there's like WASM3, but it's an interpreter that's not going to work for our use case. We need to run at native speed. So we need to have at least some other runtime uh, that'll work on a, on a small microcontroller. And I've heard from the WASM time people that, that people are interested in that, so that would be great. Yeah, so this is like yesterday, Chris Dickinson from I Live So gave, gave an awesome talk, and I thought I'd go into a little bit of history, maybe that he didn't mention. I don't know if you, anybody remembers here the JVM tool interface, uh, which is from 2004. And there was another thing before that, the JVM profiling interface from 1999. And these things worked very well. You know, uh, like this is actually a profiler, you know, of using the JVM tool interface. Again, this is 20 years old, right? And it, it was really good. I used this stuff. 
Okay, right, profiling, there you go. Uh, components from 1997, you know, so this is Microsoft stuff and it was very well done. You know, Chris was talking about how Microsoft, you know, did their own proprietary stuff with Java and it was a big mess. Yes, but it worked really well. I, I was using this stuff. Uh, JDirect, you know, that was Microsoft's proprietary, essentially foreign function interface, you know, from, from Java in their, in their JVM. 1997, you could import any native DLL or COM object. I think they had another thing called JavaCom that was similar, similar to this. And you could, you basically use this annotation in a comment because Java had no actual annotations at the time. And boom, done. You can call a native function, right, from, uh, from Java and the other way around. And you could debug, step into C++ from Java. Amazing. I actually tried to find a, a a picture of that, but it's so old I couldn't find it on, on, on Google Images. <laughs> uh, I, I failed. So, yeah, there's obviously this is not the same thing as what we're talking about as components right now. Uh, my point is that it was really easy to use. And maybe that's because it was all made by one company and they were actually really good at developer tools. Now we're trying to do similar things and recreate some of this stuff as, as a, a community, which is going to be much harder. but. You know, I'm just putting this out there for, for context, okay? And so this, this shared memory and, or multi-memory stuff, uh, I, I have a particular use case for this. And, uh, and I just wanted to, to bring up eBPF. I don't know if you guys are familiar with eBPF, but it's basically the uh, extended Berkeley packet filter, also sort of a bytecode thing that targets this uh, JIT in the Linux kernel for building filters and other, you know, basically other observability-related stuff in the kernel. Um, it's not a competitor to, to WASM, totally different use case. But it has a very useful feature, which are these so-called maps, which are shared memory between the user space and the kernel. And it's very useful because a lot of times, a, I think, a plug-in into some other larger system often reads, needs read access to a lot of stuff, but it, it can produce an output that's very small. You know? So uh, that's not something that's easy to do you know, in, in WASM or not possible, uh, really. So uh, I think that this would be cool. I mean, multiple memories, I know that it's supposed to work you know, reasonably well in Rust. I haven't tried it. Um, but in C or C++, we can also make it work with some source level annotations, which is what, what uh, BPF does. So I think this is something I might uh, you know, propose on the, uh, uh, in the community and see, see if anybody's interested in that. I was just chatting last night with uh, Luke from Fastly, and he said that it should be possible to do without, without too much difficulty. You know, LLVM supports this kind of stuff, but we have to thread it through the whole, the whole stack. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you for the presentation. It's great to see WebAssembly kind of in the real world and things that you can, can touch hardware. Um, so this is more of a philosophical question. Yeah. Based on what you have seen, do you think that this will be more um, you know, driven by companies like, like yours to, to have industrial applications like license plate or robotics with kind of like uh, specialized cameras? Or do you see that this is going to be also like people getting a random camera from Amazon and hacking it and, and starting to more, more from a, a you know, kind of um, grassroots, uh, uh, like people start at the beginning with Raspberry Pis and things like that? I see. Yeah. Well, we're working on a product, you know, so that's what it is. Uh, I guess I could imagine some of this making computer vision applications easier, making it out into the community. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't open sourced anything uh, and are not likely to do so because of business. So, I don't know. My particular take is like, I, th I think this is awesome. And, and as people watch this, as the price point of the cameras goes down and, yeah. and you have more CPU, I, you know, I want to try this now when I go sure. home. Sure. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there. There are various frameworks for doing this kind of stuff uh, besides, besides ours. Ours maybe is, is unique because of using WASM in a very, very small context. 
Yeah, on Raspberry Pi, I think it's much easier. It's, it's basically a supercomputer compared to the stuff we're dealing with. Hey, Dan, over here. Uh, hey. I have two questions, if that's OK. Uh, yeah. The first is, um, could you speak a little bit to what you think the difficulty would have been, or maybe if you did attempt to do multiple devices implementing kind of the same host environments um, without WebAssembly, would that have been more challenging? Did WASM oh. help significantly? Oh. Yeah, ab absolutely. Both on the Pi and I mean, just having multiple operating systems is already a problem. So, uh, you know, NUTX, the real-time OS that we're using, is actually POSIX compliant, you know, quote unquote, yeah, to some extent, but it's not quite the same. Uh, it's also, so maybe you could compile something that looks the same, you know, but you would have to recompile it and, and link it, you know, at least. Then we would like to have a uh, third parties writing applications for, the, for this thing as well. Third parties you can't trust, you know, in, in the same way. In Linux, you could use a container and you could sort of say that that provides sufficient isolation. Real-time OS, no way. It's not designed for multi-user, you know, so, uh, the system calls are, have no checks, you know, basically as to who's calling and for what reason, right? It's not even good process level isolation in that sense. So that's not possible. Uh, I mean, that's, that's already like a showstopper, I'd say. Cool, thank you. The second question yeah. is just, um, could you speak a little bit to the uh, comparison if you've done any benchmarking on the power draw difference between uh, the AOT compiled module and if it were interpreted through a device using PoE in particular? You know what? No, we, we didn't. Good question. Uh, but the, the frame rate that we can achieve with you know, interpreter versus uh, AOT is, is very big. So we have to do AOT, period. Cool. Anybody else? Okay. Well, let's get some coffee then. Thank you.